continue. All right. Uh, so uh, my talk today uh, is on our um, solution-based technology for the growth of three, three, uh, free, freestanding 2D oxide nanomaterials. And we'll also show some uh, interesting physical and electrochemical properties associated with this. So this is also a project that I work together with Bing Wang and Wei um, in, in the Liquid Interface Science Group um, here at Ogham to try and understand the, the growth mechanism. Uh, uh, mind. Okay. Uh, so uh, our talk here is about the ionic layer epitaxy. Uh, so this is the name I gave to this uh, approach that we developed in our lab. Basically, it is a solution-based approach uh, to the synthesis of 2D nanomaterials beyond the van der solid, uh, mostly oxides and metals. Um, in this talk, I will cover a short introduction. Then we'll just introduce the synthesis technique and the growth kinetics. Then I will show our approach um, regarding the morphology and the crystalline control. Uh, after that, I will introduce multiple physical, uh, multiple properties evolved from this two dimensional form, including electronic property, piezoelectric property, magnetic property, uh, transport memoristic property, and also uh, catalytic properties. Okay. So why do we want to do that? Uh, we had this idea basically uh, about a, a little bit more than 10 years ago uh, when um, the graphene 2D material starting to uh, emerge and becomes a very hot topic. And as soon after that, uh, many groups of 2D materials are, um, uh, de in de are developed uh, with very interesting uh, electronic properties. Right? So basically they are graphene and they're, uh, uh, TMDs, and there is also a big group as a magazine. But once we see these groups, we can see in order for this 2D morphology to be stabilized, the surface has to be stable or thermodynamic or uh, kinetically stable. Uh, that gives, that requires this material to have a more or less inert surface. So the interfacial has to be van der force rather than uh, covalent or ionic bonded. So we can call them a Van der structure or Van der solid. So because of this uh, structure requirement, and this is left behind a big group of functional material that has been studied over decades uh, that it shows very interesting properties, but they don't have this Van der structure. So uh, because we have been working on nanostructure growth for over many years, so we are, we are, uh, we are trying to see if we can have something to stabilize the surface and grow materials uh, into 2D morphology beyond this Van der Waals limitation. Uh, so actually, uh, if we look around, there are uh, materials emerging in these groups called the 2D nanomaterials beyond the Van der Waals solid continuously. Um, Mostly, uh, some of them are synthesized from a solution approach. Some of them are synthesized by vapor, vapor phase. For example, this uh, uh, lead, uh, lead sulfide uh, by using uh, surface, uh, surface chemistry to cap in um, the designed facets. So uh, people can make this nano sheet in a solution. The size is relatively small, is played in as well, but they're going towards a uh, three dimensional bulk material into a 2D uh, geometry. And more re recently, not quite recently, uh, people have been using uh, uh, CVD technique to grow um, gallium nitride, which is also a uh, or uh, a three-dimensional lattice, uh, oozite crystal, in a confined space between the graphene and the supporting substrate. There's very well, very uh, much confined space uh, to uh, direct the growth of the 2D sheet from the three-dimensional lattices. And this, this work is a, not a solution-based approach from uh, Professor um, Wenzhou Wu's group at Purdue. Um, they use a solution-based approach to grow tellurin uh, nano sheet that evolves uh, from zero to uh, 1D and extracted into two-dimensional sheet with controller thickness down to a few unit cells. Um, so our approach um, is slightly different. 
our approach started from an idea that I when, I, when I teach my courses on nanotechnology, the self-assembled model, it's, a, it's, it's an old concept. Right? People have, it is very well known for surface uh, uh, modification. Uh, as we know, if we put a crystalline surface uh, in the surfactant solution, surfactant will take um, one or two days to arrange itself in the ordered array to form a monolayer on a gold surface, for example. Uh, so this is a very well known process. Um, but uh, what we are thinking, what uh, inspired us is, can we reverse this process? For example, can we start with this surfactant model layer and use this functional group as a substrate to support this formation of the solid surface? Okay, so that's 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 a, the idea that we come up. Uh, I would say 11, 12 years ago, and then we look at back into literature and we find out that people already that did something um, previously back to 1995. Uh, they use um, this mostly or um, uh, autretic acid AA um, or other surfactant monolayer on the water surface, and then on the uh, the solution has uh, lead precursor, and apply uh, a hydrogen sulfate gas into the interface. So therefore guided by the surfactant model layer, let us solve by the crystals formed on at the water interface. So you can see here, it's a very small crystal, but they're quasi aligned on the surface. So you can start to see this kind of diffraction, uh, but they're not really 2D yet. So based on this, I, I will feel kind of excited to see this previous part. Then we apply this to our oxide nanomaterial growth environment. Uh, we use this uh, SDS surfactant uh, and make them uh, be apply them into the zinc oxide growth solution um, with these uh, precursors. And then uh, we just simply just let it grow and see if the surfactant can do anything to guide the growth. And the result is very interesting. Uh, so we received the th film growth cover the entire container surface. As you see, the seamlessly covered the entire surface. Uh, and then we can harvest this just by sticking our, surfact our, our substrate into the solution and pick them up. So you can see this is, this is the sheet that we picked up on the uh, glass substrate. Uh, there are just some cracks induced by the, by the strain. Uh, but once we put it in the uh, TEM, we can see uh, the single sheets are very large in this sort of single crystal. However, they're pretty thick. They're actually hundreds of nanometers in thickness. And the X-ray diffraction, you can sort of see this kind of multi-layer structure. Find out this one is a, a, actually a multi-layer structure. Uh, in between, they're full, the filled by these surfactant double layers uh, to make this more or less like a manvoir solid type structure. All right, so uh, this is interesting, but it's not exactly what we are trying to get. Uh, what are we trying to get is one single layer rather than this 100 nanometers multi-layer. Then it takes us, we are trying to many different approach starting from this point. It takes about a, three years, two or three years to find a good recipe to bring down the thickness from multi-layer 100 nanometers into a few nanometers or even down to one nanometer. So the solution is rather simple. We just used another surfactant, sodium uh, oleo uh, sulfate. Still the same functional group, also ionized surfactant. The difference is the tail, the organic tail is rather long compared to the SDS. So this one has a 12, uh, 18 uh, carbon uh, in the chain. So this surfactant has very limited solubility in water. So therefore, um, they will not assemble inside the water rather than just assemble on the water surface. So therefore, nothing will grow in the water rather than just at the water-air interface. By using this surfactant model layer, and we successfully achieved zinc oxide nanosheets just with a thickness of about 
uh, one, two nanometers. So this is the sheet that directly transferred from the solution surface onto the silicon surface with a triangular shape. So uh, this is very easy for us to categorize them because we can just transfer them directly onto silicon substrate or gas substrate and even TM uh, grids. So TM uh, image showing that the sheet is very flat and there's very uh, nice organized triangular shape. The thickness for this one is about two nanometers in thickness. Uh, and this is a TM image. So you can see the sort of uh, single crystalline uh, crystal lattice, and we can still see a lot of uh, dislocations formed in between uh, those uh, more uh, long range uh, uh, aligned uh, lattices. Okay, so we are pretty happy to see this result. And then we're trying to understand why, how does, how do they form into a single crystalline sheet, right? Um, First, we thought they may just start from, from one single crystal, uh, but actually from this uh, time-dependent TEM observation, we found out they actually go went through uh, uh, oriented attachment processes. So as you see, uh, we pick up the, the material from the water solution uh, every half an hour. The, the entire growth time is about two to three hours. And we found out that at the early stage, there are something, there are something on the water surface, but it's not really crystalline. So we can pick them up. Uh, we can sort of see very tiny areas that are uh, uh, evolving into crystal, but it's very hard to see um, the more, the most amorphous sheet. And as time goes by, so we can, start, we can start to see this domains for the crystalline areas, right? But they are more so they're random, they're random, and in between them, there's still amorphous phase. There's still a lot of amorphous phase. So as this more crystal to grow, so this crystal is starting to merge with this with each other, in touch with with each other, and once they're starting to touch each other, those crystalline you can see they're starting to or orient oriented themselves into a single crystal or into the same crystal orientation. So this is uh, because they, once they merge together, they can rotate based on the bonding between the uh, a strong ionic bonding or covalent bonding between the crystals. They can push them around and orient themselves into the same crystal orientation. And eventually they will uh, form a large area single crystal domain um, once the growth is completed. Right, so this is a uh, oriented attachment process. And this process is commonly seen uh, in many uh, solution-based growth processes, particularly nanoparticles and nanowires. Right? But for this one, for this thin sheet growth, uh, this is the first time being reported. And uh, uh, this uh, and uh, um, the surfactant, because there are certain freedom in the surfactant, the support substrate allows the crystal to, to rotate. So this gives this capability for the crystal to align themselves from a single crystal in sheet. So the next question is, can we control the thickness? Because the thickness is a key for the two dimensional materials. And our hypothesis is the uh, layer, the very thin layer beneath the surfactant uh, that, that controls the thickness. Right? So first we calculated the electric double layer underneath the fully ionized surfactant, the SDS surfactant or SOS surfactant. All right. So we can see the, of course, this mechanism is negatively charged with a sulfate group, and zinc ions will be attracted towards the interface. All right. So we can we can cal we calculate this distribution of zinc ions and their concentrated region or um, uh, this double layer region. Uh, stern layer is within from one nanometer to one point five nanometers in this range. range. And we can see the thickness of all these nanosheets is mostly around this level, around this level. Okay. So in order to prove this uh, hypothesis, we made we designed our uh, a simple trough, right? just like a um, LB trough. Um, this is something that we made, and we have a bar that can be moved. So we add our 
uh, precursor in one side and apply the spectrum on side and on one side, and then move the bar to control the the area. Therefore, we can control the, the surface pressure or the packing density for the surfactant. So this is the the, fitting, the the measured surface pressure based on the surface areas. All right. So then we apply our system to the growth, and what we can see here is at a different surface density for the surfactant, we can receive the zinc oxide nanosheet pretty much along with the same morphology, but the thickness is slightly different and we characterize, the, we characterize them uh, using atomic force microscopy. And if we further increase the density all, uh, above this uh, 6.75, uh, then uh, nothing will be received. So our colleague Isabella, they helped us to uh, uh, did this molecular dynamics calculation to find the um, distribution of a zinc iron underneath underneath the surfactant. So what we can see is corresponding to different uh, density, different density. Uh, so the zinc iron distribution is dis uh, has certain distributed distribution is varied right underneath the surfactant. So this, this red, uh, uh, yellow dots are the head group of surfactant. You can see the distribution also varies. So if the concentration is too high, then we can see the structure is destroyed. The interface is destroyed. And then at this situation, we, won't, we didn't receive any uh, sheet growth. If we plot this simulated distribution together, we can see from the interface, the zinc rich zone varies based on a different surface concentration. All right. So we can plot them with this red, red curve, with this red curve based on the surface pressure. All right. So at each point, we measure the thickness. So they show certain correlations with the surfactant um, pressure. Okay, so, but you can see they're not exactly matched, even though they follow the same trend, the only two points in the center match well, the two points on the end is kind of off, right? So here we want to know, uh, we want to um, notice that is in this small scale, the thickness of zinc oxide is not continuous. It's determined by the unicells. So we have to uh, correlate this into unicells Right. So for this center two points, they sit right in the unicell, three unicells and two unicells level. Right. If we go here, uh, it will move towards the four unicells, so it's sitting between three and four unicells. And if we go further down, it's sitting between two and one unicells. So it's something in between here. Okay, so because the, in, uh, the quantity is very large for our samples, we can simply, um, connect the many samples and make cross sections and allow us to find out the zinc oxide nanosheet cross sections with all different number of unicells. You can see this is one unicell, two unicells, three unicells, and four unicells. Um, for the nanosheets that be made in kinds one to different surface, um, uh, surface pressure or uh, solution uh, density. Okay. So um, then we further change the interface by uh, moving this uh, water air interface in water oil interface um, to discover, to study the growth behavior. So we replaced the top or we applied the um, top surface of air by um, an oil face. Here is a toluene, okay? So, and we uh, went through the same growth process and we received, also received the, the nice zinc oxide nano sheet well, with the very large sizes. And we can see that the nano sheet actually the surface becomes even uh, smoother and with even less uh, byproduct or, or dirt coming out from the surface. Right? And what interesting to us is we find out this sheet it turned from this more mostly single crystalline into polycrystalline. And there's still a one, uh, the uh, one uh, o -O surface um, exposed 
a sheet, but they have the show domains. I can see the domains is between five to 10 nanometers. Right. So I think we think this, this could be attributed to the, of course it's attributed by, uh, by the oil phase. Uh, this is because the, when we add oil phase into the interface, it will create a much higher uh, hindrance, steric hindrance towards the rotation or movement of the, of the surfactant. As we mentioned earlier, formation of a single crystal requires the rotation of the crystalline uh, seeds into the same orientation. So now if the hindrance becomes higher, the rotation becomes harder. So therefore, uh, uh, the uh, originally uh, seeds will stop to rotate and just form the polycrystalline sheet instead of a single crystalline sheet. Okay, but uh, uh, oil interface, actually gives a better um, morphology control towards the, towards the nano sheet. As you see from the water air interface, we can some, see some, some crystals precipitated at, at the nano sheet, but for oil interface, the sheet remains pretty uh, clean. The overall percentage is pretty much the same because we turned into the same materials, in same amount of materials into nano sheets. The yield is the same. However, uh, the thickness distribution for the oil interface is much narrow and smaller comparing to the uh, water air interface. So which gives a much better control and the distribution for the nano sheet. This is because the oil interface gives is much stable compared to the air interface. As we see, our growth is, uh, is um, performed at a temperature from 60 degree to 80 degree. So at that temperature, the water surface is pretty dynamic the water molecules jumping up and down from the water phase into vapor phase. Right. So for the growth, we need a very stable phase and all your interface make the surface becomes much more stable. And so therefore gives much better control towards the nano sheet morphology and cleanness and flatness. Right. So that's a nice part of from, uh, from uh, the interface control. Okay. So because uh, the interface is so important, we are further looking into ways to control the interface. So then um, more recent result, uh, progress that we made is we're trying to uh, control the interface by learning from the biomedical, uh, biological uh, um, world uh, through a bio, it's uh, something well known as the biomineralization uh, processes. In the biomineralization process, such as in, in the pearls or many other um, biological systems, they actually use well-mixed positive and negative charged amino acid residues to control, to direct the crystallization of crystals in the biological system, such as a calcium oxide right? in the amino acid. They have both um, amino group and a negative charged um, this is called uh, oxygen, uh, common oxygen groups. Okay. So this will better balance the charge for the oxides growth because for the formation of the oxides, we need both cations and ions going towards the interface. Right. So uh, Isabella uh, helped us to, uh, do, uh, to do the uh, simulation, MD simulation. And we did show that once we uh, introduce a mixture of surfactant, with amino acid and the sulfate uh, groups, a negative charge and a positive charge, we mix it together. And we showed that this uh, copper ion distribution is not very, it's not uh, uniform. It did have some influences towards the distribution of copper in the near the interface at the water air interface for the distribution of copper uh, ions. We don't exactly know what, how this will influence our growth, but this is indeed they'll introduce some uh, in, in, um, effect to the, uh, to the growth system. And more importantly is uh, this mixture charge surfactant brings, makes the interface much more stable um, compared to just one type of surfactant. As you see here, uh, we compare this, this blue dot is just a pure SOS surfactant and this red and black dots showing the different ratio between those positive and negative mixed uh, charged uh, interfaces. Okay, so as this copper concentration 
decreases. This marks the growth procedure during the formation of the uh, cobalt oxide. Oh, by the way, we are using cobalt oxide to, uh, for the growth for this case. Uh, during the growth, as the cobalt oxide concentration uh, decreases, the surface roughness significantly increases for just one type of surfactant. But if we have two types of surfactant, the surface roughness remains at a very stable stage within a wide range of this cobalt iron concentration, which means during the growth processes from beginning to the end stage, once a majority of cobalt ions is consumed um, below the supersaturation level. And you can see comparing this surface, uh, just one type of surfactant and a two type of surfactant, the stability is completely different. We know this surface is not good for the sheet growth and this surface is, is much preferred for the sheet growth. So therefore, we'll be able to achieve a single crystal growth for this material by using combined surfactant rather than single type of surfactant. As you see here, this continuous sheet is polycrystalline cobalt oxide just by using SOS surfactant. The continuous, very tiny crystalline without much um, uh, orientation alignment. Uh, for this one, same cobalt oxide, same growth system, just using two mixture surfactant, nine to one, and we can receive this single crystalline triangular shaped a uh, cobalt oxide uh, spec, uh, nano sheet with a thickness about one to two nanometers. This is very nice. Uh, actually, it's a very nice uh, catalytic material. Okay, so then uh, we're trying to uh, perform um, uh, some in, in situ study um, to understand how this sheet, uh, crystal is evolved during these processes. And um, then we, uh, we look into um, the ways and we find this uh, liquid interface um, glazing, glazing angle X-ray. Incident angle X-ray is very capable to study this liquid air interface crystallization. So we come to um, uh, Wei and Binghua and ask their help to see if we can do something here. So um, I'm very grateful that they helped us. We designed this uh, in situ reaction chamber, so as you see, we have the top and trough. Uh, then we have the temperature controller um, beneath it to control the temperature in the solution uh, inside. Uh, then we can apply our growth system in this chamber, and then we bring this to um, um, to argon, and then uh, we perform this in situ study and find the. Uh, air to protect and also electricity to control the temperature. And we uh, use this X beam to observe this very thin, uh, a couple of nanometers thickness crystallization on the water surface and see what happened. And the result is pretty successful. And we will be able to see uh, many different crystal uh, um, growth behavior by this system. This study of zinc oxide, the paper hasn't been concluded yet. Uh, and also for this cobalt oxide and a few other crystals. So this is the, some um, rough initial uh, understanding we obtained uh, from this um, incident angle uh, X-ray um, diffraction. And we can see with this two surfactant or double surfactant, and we can see at the beginning, there's evolve of this surface layer. We, we think this could be uh, attributed by the surfactant uh, packing with the help of the iron beneath it, the initial crystallization at the at, at the surface, at the surface, right? So, so same. This is a single surfactant. It's the same. Um, and for this double surfactant, we don't really see too much a new uh, crystalline formed underneath the sheet, but this peak becomes stronger and stronger, indicating uh, the crystal just to grow uh, following the original arrangement uh, built up by the surfactant monolayer to, uh, to induce the growth um, of this monocrystalline uh, material underneath the surfactant. However, from this double surfactant, we do see something that is evolved is more like a polycrystalline um, with a stronger difference, with more different uh, lattice uh, formed beneath it. So we believe this is because of the surface roughness 
and uh, to induce more crystals with different angles that is packed underneath the surface uh, layer that brings different um, crystal orientations. What was the surfactant in that particular case? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I, you kind of uh, uh, cut it off. What's the question? Can you say that again? What was the surfactant in their part particular case? Uh, I guess the first part is mostly cut it off. <laughs> I think he's asking what kind of surfactants you use. Oh, uh, we use. Um... I, was asking, I was asking about surfactant. What kind of surfactant was in the. Oh, this one is use uh, same surfactant as we showed here. Um, the double surfactant is uh, SOS and uh, oleomine, and the single surfactant is just uh, SOS. So this is just SOS, and this one is SOS and uh, audio main one to nine ratio. Okay. So with with this capability and understanding, we'll be able to uh, further extend uh, our technique to many different other materials, and it should pretty good success uh, uh, result. So this is a bismuth oxide, which has a cubic lattice. Uh, uh, we use the same uh, combination of uh, surfactant, and we, you, you can see uh, we raise this single crystal um, cubic, not cubic, a square, a square sheet, square sheet. Right? Uh, and then uh, magnesium oxide. Now, this one is a layered structure anyway, uh, but we can also receive this single layered magnesium oxide through our uh, approach. Oh, still with a micrometer, more than micrometer in size, but the thickness, this one says thickness is actually less than one nanometer. And with this more stable interface, we can actually um, introduce doping into the, into the system without a destroyer lattice. Actually, we know that doping is kind of, kind of challenge for the nanoscale materials. Here, we can actually dope zinc oxide with nickel, uh, a very useful dope material to bring the spin triangles property into the material. So you can see we see very nice nano sheet with a very nice lattice and the uh, nickel has uniform distribution in the sheet as well. You can even make uh, an iron oxide nano sheet, uh, even though it's, it's not a successful in the discredit single crystal sheet at this point, but they show the large area single crystal domain for this material. Okay, so that's all for the growth. Uh, of the material and we're still exploring our technology to further to other materials uh, with different potential application um, directions. So here, uh, I want to introduce a little bit more regarding the properties that we can expect it from, uh, from those uh, confined two dimensional nano sheet as this material um, doesn't really naturally show uh, the 2D geometry. So first one is come with, from, with our first discovery of a zinc oxide nano sheet. And we found out that it's actually showed a P-type conductivity. Right? So we made a transistor and it showed the uh, P-type conductivity. Uh, as we know, zinc oxide is a typical N-type material. Right? So P-type is not stable, but why this material shows a stable P-type conductivity? Uh, this is because this material is not just a pure zinc oxide lattice. Actually, the surface is covered, is capped by the sulfate surfactant monolayer. The capping of this surfactant monolayer, um, because of the negative charged header group, it become it'll become an electron uh, draining of sight to attract an electron from the lattice into this interface to build up at this region because of this charge attracting behavior. So this makes the sheet itself uh, becomes electron deficient. And this makes it, of course, it turned into a P-type conductivity. Right? So um, 
this was proved by the uh, DFT calculation to show um, this firm network actually moves down to the conduction band. Well, anyway, um, this one actually is pretty common phenomenon for surface modification. So we know this will happen if we modify the surface and will deplete the charge to the surface. But this one only applies to one or two nanometers due to this uh, charge surface charge density, right? It will, it usually is ignored for all the other materials. Uh, doesn't matter if the thin films or nanocrystals um, or, or in or both crystals for course, right? But because of nano sheet itself, uh, the thickness is only one to two nanometers. So this depletion can actually go in across the entire sheet to make the entire sheet become the p-type conducting chain. So that's that's a uh, that's a uh, that's a beauty um, for reducing the thickness and make the surface property becomes a bulk property of the material. Right. So uh, most recently, and this paper uh, has just been uh, published on research uh, this year, and we uh, as uh, we studied the piezoelectric property of zinc oxide. And uh, piezoelectric study is one of the major uh, research direction in our group. And one of the motivation here for us to make a zinc oxide is trying to uh, make it, uh, to use is a piezoelectric property. So here we, um, we use um, PFM uh, by optimize uh, the interface interaction uh, for the polarization and the surface, uh, uh, surface charge um, artifacts. And we quantified, uh, measure the D33 uh, for multiple nano sheets that we'll be able to make with different thickness from um, uh, 1.5 nanometers all the way to uh, 4.5 nanometers. And we received this sort of distribution of D33 values for those um, nano sheets. Okay, so this, uh, Bar here, that's the bulk value that had been uh, measured from a single crystal zinc oxide bulk material. Okay, so you can see most of them are sit above this average value, but doesn't really show a trend. Uh, again, because the thickness in this range is more or less is, is related to the unicell, they're not really continuous, right? So we can average uh, those thickness into the unicell level to make it into unicell. So this now, this becomes more, a little bit more clear. Right? So for the three unicell, six unicells and the nine unicells, they're sitting at the bulk value level. And we found out for this four unicells, five unicells and seven unicells, other unicell, unicells that are not three unicells um, in the sequence, they have the value above about the like, um, 30, 40 percent higher than the bulk value. That's very interesting, and we don't know why uh, has this relationship. And we have been trying to looking for someone who maybe come with a, a DFT or other computation to help us explain this phenomenon. But we found out this uh, tri-layer relationship uh, about the D33 uh, value is quite intriguing for this. Uh, ultra small nano sheet material. Anyway, okay, so this is another interesting property that we found out from the nano sheet. Uh, something known as a D0 magnetization. Uh, so this one is, uh, has been discovered many, many years ago. So it's uh, uh, and from many um, metal oxides. So it's, it's, uh, it's to find out the kind of eye vacancies that can induce local moment and associated with room temperature ferromagnetism in this paramagnetic metal oxide uh, due to the dangling bonds of oxygen. Because, uh, because this um, magnetization doesn't involve the D electrons, so it was called D0 magnetization. And uh, early research has found this uh, magnetization from many zinc oxide based materials. Okay, so we performed uh, the magnetic measurement uh, on our nano sheet. Right? So we distributed them on um, the, uh, the single layer of this zinc oxide nano sheets on sapphire substrate. Uh, from for both samples, uh, one is uh, the single crystalline sheet 
synthesized on water air interface. And another one is a polycrystal nanosheet synthesized on water oil interface. And we found out both in the room temp in the uh, low temperature and the room temperature, uh, they showed a strong ferromagnetic behavior. From, um, uh, and the saturated, the saturated magnetization actually reached uh, 57 uh, EMU per gram at this low temperature, even at the room temperature, and this value is still about around 50. So this polycrystal nanosheet gives a higher value comparing to the single crystal nanosheet in both cases. So if, uh, we, if we try to understand this based on the D0 magnetization and from this supersaturated value at this point, uh, and we can estimate this zinc oxide vacancy, uh, roughly they contribute two mu B per vacancy due to dangling bonds. And in order to achieve this value, we consider this vacancy concentration, they need to reach about 30%. That's a very high value and usually doesn't exist stably in the bulk material. Right. But anyway, uh, we compare the value for many other previous studies in cost and nanomaterials and bulk thin films. Uh, so there are a few orders of magnitude higher compared to this because this is just the surface property and the bulk is very small. And also it reaches pretty much the same value for other uh, two dimensional materials, two uh, magnetic uh, materials. And all these materials are uh, about room temperature uh, ferromagnetism. Okay, so in order to understand why uh, this material um, is able to hold that much uh, zinc vacancies in order to contribute such a higher super, um, uh, saturated magnetization, um, uh, uh, Dan Morgan, our uh, collaborator, helped us to cal uh, calculate this energy uh, to show that hydrogen incorporation is believed to be able to stay with such a high zinc oxide, a zinc vacancy uh, concentration. Right. So during our growth, there is a significant amount of hydrogen ions in our system and allows us to stabilize uh, a high concentration of zinc vacancies, of zinc vacancies. And as we see here, uh, as a synthesized without annealing, this material doesn't really show the magnet magnetization. We have to anneal them in organ in the atmosphere to remove the hydrogen and free the zinc iron zinc vacancies. Therefore, we can achieve the super, the, the magnetization as we observed from those samples. And if we anneal them in hydrogen back again to bring some hydrogen, and then we show that the, the material becomes paramagnetic again. All right, so this is a very interesting study and we are still trying to study more if we can really control this and correlate this with some other semiconductor conductivity with this uh, um, uh, magnetic material. And another interesting, uh, property that we find from this material is a conductive, uh, conduct, uh, conductive uh, behavior. And we know it's a memoristic behavior. So we made the transistor. We made a transistor using the ultra small nano sheet. And then of course, uh, we, we nearly to remove the surfactant uh, and then we coat the surface with a thin layer of uh, aluminum oxide by AOD, atomic layer deposition. And then, we measure the, uh, the transport behavior and we find out it shows very strong memoristic behavior over, um, um, over, over minutes of cycles. All right, so uh, this onset and the reset uh, situation can be, uh, can be remained um, uh, above 10 to the fourth over uh, over a very long time. So this is very nice uh, memoristic behavior from this zinc oxide nanosheet. And of course, this one um, doesn't sh really show from the nanosheet without the packaging of this uh, uh, coating of this two very thin 2D oxide materials, amorphous oxide. Um, but after we coat this, and then we find out uh, this very interesting uh, memoristic behavior. 
so we are trying to understand what, what happened for this new interface that we brought into this nano sheet. Uh, as we see that uh, we coded this uh, zinc oxide with uh, aluminum oxide. So they still have the zinc oxide nano sheet uh, lattice without any destroying uh, of this lattice, single crystal lattice by aluminum oxide coating. And zinc is still remains in the triangle and is aluminum uh, distribution covers everywhere. Okay, so we made the cross section and we did this cross section elemental analysis. As we see here, aluminum oxide, aluminum remains uh, at the surface, zinc oxide is at this interface. Uh, th uh, this is very thin zinc oxide and this is our silicon, right? Very clear, they're not um, really going into each other. So this is what happens to the interface. As we know, this memoristic behavior is, as, is a result of oxygen vacancy in, in this type of oxide material. And our study uh, therefore focuses on oxygen vacancy as well. So we performed the uh, yields study on the interface of the zinc oxide and uh, uh, zinc oxide or aluminum oxide interfaces. As we see here, for this as received interfaces, um, uh, we receive the zinc, zinc oxide. Uh, so we do see just a zinc peaks, uh, oxygen peaks and a zinc peaks with, more, with a pretty normal uh, uh, intensity. And the ratio we calculated between zinc and oxygen is 1.1. So this is within the error range. And for this aluminum oxide and zinc oxide um, uh, interface um, for the zinc oxide level, then we can see the zinc starting to build up a shoulder peak and oxygen also build up a shoulder peak. Right? So this is a characteristic peak remarks the formation of oxygen vacancies. And also the ratio between zinc and oxygen becomes significantly higher, suggest so um, there's more, uh, there's a significant oxygen deficiency in the zinc oxide level. Right? So why um, introduce a very thin layer of aluminum, uh, of aluminum oxide that can bring a lot of zinc the oxygen vacancies uh, in this material, in this material, uh, this is related to, um, to the uh, atomic layer growth. Right? Again, our film is very thin, any surface related uh, depletion is really a bulk uh, property. Right? So as we know, near the surface, uh, oxygen will have a certain balance, you know, going jumping in the oxygen atmosphere, it will jump in from the bulk into the surface, the form oxygen vacancies in the, in, the, in the lattice and the state as a surface uh, oxygen um, ions. So there is a certain uh, uh, um, balance at the interface. Right. So once we apply this sheet in the in LD chamber and let the, another um, TMA, the trimethyl aluminum to grow, right. so this trimethyl aluminum will certainly react uh, with the surface hydroxyl group uh, to bond with oxygen. If there are some surface oxygen ions, this will be the first choice for the TM, TMA to, cho to choose and to bond um, and to grow the aluminum oxide the layer. Right? So this will deplete the surface oxygen, the surface oxygen ions, and then this will drive the equivalency uh, for the formation of more oxygen vacancies in the bulk and then push more surface oxygen towards the, um, towards the surface, to push more oxygen iron towards the surface. And then more TMA will come in to react and then forms a single sheet, right? But then eventually builds up the balance, builds build, build, build up a continuous film and, and a balanced interface. So therefore this leaves a lot of oxygen vacancies in the bulk, in the bulk. So that, that's why we can, we can have the high concentration of oxygen vacancies due to the stabilize the surface uh, TMA or uh, aluminum oxide coating, and then achieve this interesting uh, memoristic transfer behavior. Okay. All right, so that's uh, the physical properties um, that we, we've discovered so far. And the last part of this talk, uh, I want to uh, show a little bit about uh, the catalytic behavior. Right? So that's another main uh, motivation for us to develop this thin sheet. As we, as we know, the electrocatalysis or photoelectrocatalysis, uh, in order for them to have the high performance, uh, there are a few um, key perspectives. One is we need to improve the charge transport. 
right? Um, and uh, then uh, we need to um, maximize the surface area, the surface area. And on the other hand, we minimize the materials usage, particularly the rare earth uh, material or precious metals usage. So that's a general goal uh, for us to develop a high performance catalysis. Right? Uh, in general, the nanoparticles is the best choice because it's small and a lot of exposed to surface. However, but they're not stable because once, as we know, um, once, uh, uh, once the particle go into small and the surface becomes more active and then uh, uh, the, um, uh, and the particle will be uh, agglomerated and to minimize the surface energy and then uh, decrease the reactivity. Right? So that's a general problem for, for the nanoparticle in, in terms of catalytic development. So here, the nano sheet essentially is a, a couple of nanometers uh, thickness, and they can remain stable once being applied to the surface. Uh, and meanwhile, uh, and they can minimize the amount of materials that can be involved in the catalyst development and shows uh, all the nice features can be enabled by the nanomaterials. So our first work uh, is done using uh, this uh, nickel hydroxide. Uh, this is a very, uh, this is a sim very simple work. We just apply our approach to grow this nickel hydroxide, not really oxide, nickel hydroxide, one nanometer sheet. It's a, it's a mixture between um, amorphous and uh, nanocrystalline. Actually, this is a better geometry uh, uh, for, for, the, for the catalytic application. So we apply this, we can make it very large and cover the entire wafer surface, and they showed a very nice um, uh, catalytic um, um, behavior in terms of this uh, uh, electric chemical um, uh, current, current density by comparing to the bulk material or other thick uh, nickel hydroxide materials. All right. So uh, we uh, explored this. And other materials, and this one is a cobalt oxide. That that's what this work is before our synthesis uh, for the single crystalline cobalt oxide. So here we just make a thin film, the very large thin film sheet covering the entire uh, wafer surface. So the thickness um, from the cracked area we can find is about two point eight nanometers. Uh, it's thin enough um, to provide the nanoscale enhancement towards the catalytic behavior. Uh, compared to the physical properties, the catalytic behavior indeed has uh, doesn't have that high requirement for the quality of the sheet. That's good for it as well. Uh, we found out this bonding is uh, it's a mixture between cobalt oxide and cobalt cobalt hydroxide. It's also a good combination to fulfill the uh, the redox reaction uh, required for the cobalt ions. And by doing this electrochemical analysis, we found out. But comparing the bulk, cobalt oxide bulk, uh, this photocurrent, the this current density significantly enhanced uh, at, a, at a given um, um, over, over potential. Um, it's, it's about, a, more, about, about a 10 times higher compared to bulk, the significant improvement. And this uh, TAFO slope showing the uh, interface kinetics, this uh, nano sheet uh, is also uh, significantly lower compared to the bulk. Uh, same thing can be found from um, from impedance measurement, uh, or showing this uh, nano sheet because of very thin thickness provide the much better charge transfer behavior uh, comparing to the thick uh, material. Uh, so we will apply this same thing towards the uh, photoelectrochemical ca characterization, and we showed that because of this highly improved charge transport for this nano sheet, the photocurrent density on uh, untyped silicon is significantly enhanced compared to uh, it's in bar to uh, other nice um, catalysts being developed um, for silicon materials. And it's significantly higher than the bulk uh, cobalt oxide. Uh, and we uh, also apply this to uh, cobalt, this uh, cobalt sheet, uh, square sheet. Uh, it's not, uh, it's square-ish, even though it's a polycrystalline, we can still find a lot of single crystalline domains. Um, and they exposed this uh, catalytic active 101 surface, very nice. And so make it a very uh, catalytic active. So we compare this to um, platinum uh, nanoparticles and this uh, uh, enhancement, uh, this uh, catalytic enhancement showing significantly 
uh, is significantly higher. You can see this black uh, curve is about 15 times uh, exaggerated, can still not catch this same level as uh, plating and a sheet. Um, and this, uh, uh, this current density, you can see uh, as based on scan rate is um, more than 10 times, more than order of magnitude higher uh, compared to the bulk. And even once we increase the thickness, the the photocurrent, the current indeed decreases, so which means a small take thickness indeed uh, uh, or uh, helpful. Right. Okay, so uh, with this, I think it's about an hour. Uh, so I want to make a conclusion of my uh, talk today. Uh, so here, uh, my uh, main topic is about uh, this ionic layer epitaxy technology that we developed in our lab. So we think it's a very versatile uh, solution-based approach for growing many different kinds of 2D materials from materials beyond to the limitation of Van uh, interaction. So it has good um, scalability and also have atomic level thickness control.